Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Lisa Timmel. I'm the director of new work here uh, at the Boston and Bethany Theater Company. And I'm very pleased to have you all here and the women up here on the stage um, for our Women in Action panel. Uh, this is a conversation between uh, four amazing um, writer, activist, creators um, about women writers claiming the agency in the American theater. So that's sort of our topic today. Um, Special thank you to Kate Snodgrass for hosting us here at the Boston Playwrights Theater. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm just going to introduce our panelists and then um, we will get on with our conversation. So uh, starting at the far end is Charlotte Ian, who is the Artistic Director of Sleeping Weasel and the Playwright in Residence at Wheaton College. And then we have Ruth McGrath, who, so look at my notes here, um, is uh, a leader in the new opera world and playwrights and, and um, a founder, yes, of Cathy Anacarcio Ensemble. Um, and then we have Karnet Speech, who uh, recently won an Obie Award for Life and Achievement in 2012. She's the founder of No Casper Theater Alliance. She's a um, playwright, songwriter, editor, and translator, and um, just a real force in the American theater. Uh, this is Schlesinger, is immediately to my left. Uh, she uh, is on sabbatical from uh, Columbia College in Chicago and um, writer, artist, thinker, actress. So, I would like you to, Lisa, to please say a few words about Vida. We are here as part of, um, as part of this, so we can start there. Um, if you haven't heard, Vida is uh, an organization, Vida Women in Literary Arts. They formed a couple of years ago. It's formed by Kate Marvin, a poet from New York, and Aaron Lilieu, a poet from Florida, um, to address inequity in publishing. They're both um, um, extraordinary poets, and they wanted to include playwriting as part of literary arts. Sometimes we're excited. <laughs> 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 That's how we felt. So our hearts were warm. Um, we weren't over the other building. And, um, uh, since the organization started, it, that we, we are often left out of that conversation because we aren't dealing with publishing. Publishing is the least of the issues and childhood challenges that we face. Um, the air, uh, Kate was very aware of the inequities in American theater um, in terms of gender and um, race, ethnicity, and she um, and they primarily focus on gender. Um, and she asked us in, and we've been in conversation uh, since, the four of us as playwriting committee, and they've been really extraordinary conversations that I'm thrilled to open to the public now. Um, in the meantime, Vida has uh, yearly done a count of the literary magazines around the country. You can look this count up, they just put out in 2012. You can look it up, they do pie charts on vidaweb.org. Um, it done in red and blue, and you won't be surprised. Although you will be um, a bit saddened by the the way those pie charts still look. But they, um, their main mission is to start conversation around the country around these issues and to activate change. So here we are. <laughs> um, Charlotte, as our sort of fearless leader in this panel and put this together, um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about. Um, sort of the founding slash reviving of Sleeping Weasel and um, what some of your goals are for uh, the organization. Yes, um, I, well, it, it goes back to 2010 when I decided to, to start to revive the company. I had the company with my husband, British filmmaker David Hawkins, who founded the company in England in 1998. Um, and we did do some work together in New York via the company but then sadly he passed away of cancer in 2004 and I had to keep going with my job as a professor and to keep writing. I decided for a few years that I'm just going to keep my head to the ground and keep writing. But you know, I write idiosyncratic plays, I've been told. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> no, they're very hard to uh, get people to read. Uh, they're very easy to get my friends and colleagues and people who've already directed my plays to read. But for strangers to read a play of mine is not easy. So I realized that once again I have to do this myself. 
Um, however, you know, I've never been a person comfortable with just promoting myself. I, I, I'm much happier in a group of people. And I decided we we're going to, rather than do these one-off productions, which I did in my 20s and 30s, <coughs> I didn't want to go that far into my life, we decided, you know, to really scaffold the company and collected about 30 affiliated artists in different genres and different fields, composition, design, writers, directors, a couple of performers, a um, filmmaker, and um, look at this group of people as a movement. And suddenly it, it, it becomes very interesting and powerful when you're not just trying to promote yourself. And I have a very strong curatorial mind as it is. I have a background in visual art. I, my first job was at the Whitman Museum. And I worked at Sprisky Gallery in New York. So I, I see things that way. I see things in conversation with each other, whether it be painting, sculpture, or people, and their work. So it's very natural to me to work that way. And so Sleeping Weasel wants to kind of be a movement of um, people making what I like to call art theater. Um, art theater for me can be music, it can be a visual artist giving a slideshow, it, it can be cross genre, it can be anything, but I, I consider it art theater. And I want to invite people into those moments, uh, those high moments of being elevated. It's interesting. Um, I didn't know you had a uh, background in visual art, and of course earlier when you were speaking about the influence of the visual art world and how work is produced and promoted um, in, in, in that world, and how it's affect how, affected how you produce your own work. Mm -hmm. um, so would you take a few minutes to talk about, um, about that relationship? Yes, I um, am at the Art Institute of Chicago and um, on the faculty there in the writing department, and before that I had taught in a lot of theater departments and English departments and taught playwriting specifically. Um, but it's interesting being there because it's an art school and they just are more abstract. And I am abstract. <laughs> and I'm realizing years that I'm abstract. You know? And theater can be very concrete. And it's, it makes me feel very at home around other abstract people. <laughs> And it also, when you put writing into that as a, um, with that background, you're allowed to be a little more abstract about the form of what you're doing and think of it as an art form and not as like, this is how you're supposed to write a play and this is the system of how it's supposed to look on the page. And um, being around a lot of visual artists, that's one thing that really opened my mind. But also the way that they use space is really fascinating and inspiring to me because um, we have a lot of black boxes in the theater, but they have white boxes. They have these gallery, very light-filled spaces with windows, and um, and the audience is allowed to wander in and out. And they call more performance-related work this time-based art. So it makes me look back at the theater and think about time and think about okay, well, what can we do with time, and how can we layer these time signatures that we traffic in, in a way that can also be viewed as a work of art. Um, so that's been really inspiring, and also just thinking of the artist having a studio, or the way that, um, that I teach art is modeled in our department on the way that you have a studio artist and a mentor and an apprenticeship that you have time alone with the art, whereas in a lot of our playwriting workshops, we're in groupthink from the very beginning of the uh, origin of the project. So how do you have time to sit alone with your work? And so I find that also really inspiring to think about this kind of solitude or sanctuary of your own view of your work in your studio, if it's even in the studio of your mind. <laughs> and that connects a little bit, Lisa, to what you've been you know, working on yourself, on your sabbatical, and this moment of transition that you're in. Um, can you describe for us sort of how that, that being in a quiet space and a homely space works for you in your art? Um, yeah, <coughs> I'm just, you no, know, I'm just listening to everyone speak today, I feel like the, the top of my list is the collectivity that I feel so strongly that being in, you know, first I always want to hear 
what everyone else is doing, <laughs> it brings, act, it's like an activator for all of us. And that really excites me. It, it, generates, um, it generates the next project. And I work kind of vision by vision. I see something and then I go towards it and try to see how it will happen. So every project is completely learning from the ground up. And um, as Lisa said, I'm in sabbatical and I'm in this like, cave of quiet reading, collecting. I'm actually even reading the dictionary, which I didn't, I forgot how to do because I've been looking at the dictionary online. I'm not doing that anymore. And the words in the dictionary are really different than the words <laughs> as they're given online. So um, I guess just to say my current, each project is different and it asks for a completely different process. And I think that that's terrifying at the beginning because you think, I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, my most recent project is what I'm calling slow theater, a slow theater project. It's a kind of local board theater. And I live with a musician. So I wrote this play that I call Black, um, a back porch blues play. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to perform it on the back porch. Get his guitar out, get the text, bring some people in, mm -hmm. start it. Um, bring a couple of musicians, acoustic, and see how they improv, how their improvisational method sort of affects the text, and see where it goes. Like if we would drop a scene because the music went off in this great way, or if they would be quiet for a scene, or if they would decide they wanted to read a character. Um, so I guess this is just an example of like meeting the real meaning. I think I'm tired of pretending. So this is a theater, <laughs> not pretending, and showing up and being real with the text, and being real with the music, and seeing what it takes um, <coughs> Kind of, of, of all, you have a very prolific catalog of plays, mm -hmm. and um, a special genius for sort of getting out there and making connections. And we were speaking about um, The Way of Water and Spark uh, earlier, and I thought, uh, yeah, just here to speak to all of that. Sure. Your process on that. Just... Be happy to. Uh, well, you know, I should foreground this by saying that it, uh, 10 years ago, uh, in this kind of local work kind of way, uh, except it was national, uh, yeah, uh, a group of 12 artists, uh, musicians, actors, writers, practitioners, scholars uh, gathered together around something called No Passport, which is a and just an idea I have when I was actually here at Radcliffe at the Institute for Advanced Study as a fellow, and, and I uh, I felt like I it would be nice to have like a hub <laughs> of some kind uh, where people could just brainstorm and think, and maybe like a roving salon was sort of the idea in my head. Uh, but all these these twelve core artists that form No Passport uh, were all people who were interested in words of music, uh, and were all primarily playwrights, although not all of them. Some were perform. Uh, Performers uh, who wanted to experiment with words and music and what that meant on the page, but also what that meant in terms of uh, creating durational performance. Uh, and so we, we, we decided we collectively write things. We wrote a manifesto called Dirty Thoughts About Money. And, uh, and, and it, it was really cool. And so it's still archived online. You can go to hotreview.org and look it up there. And there are archives under No Passport. We also wrote some things collectively. We performed them at Brick in New York and at Tonic. Uh, just kind of really, really just experimenting and sometimes sharing characters we'd written with each other uh, and then kind of creating our own text based off on that. And then uh, that same year, um, I was a residence on a TCGP residency at INTAR. Uh, and uh, towards the end of my residency, I thought I want to do something that's sort of like a meeting of minds, as it were, of Latino artists, playwrights primarily, uh, to talk about, uh, to talk in a national way. Because often New York artists talk to each other, LA artists talk to each other, the Chicago people talk to each other. But rarely does that convergence happen unless it's organized by somebody else, you know? And so I thought, why don't we just have a big symposium? Well, what happened is that people flew in on their own dime, which was really gracious of them, uh, to have this big talk, which was a public lecture talking about the state of Latino theater making, uh, that ended up being a three-hour jam session where we Diane Cruz was pulling out poems from her backpack, and like, <laughs> the mayor was like, I just wrote this yesterday, you know? <laughs> and then I, you know, I remember Gary Zacarias said, who's a playwright based in D.C., said, um, Oh, I wish we had this all the time. And I was like, yeah, I know. And then we're all like walking home, right? Separate ways, subway, plane, etc. And I was walking and I was like, it's bitter cold. And I was like, oh my god, no, 
no, passport is this. It's this thing, you know, where we can all sort of be jamming together. And so I went to my core of 12, and I said, what do you think about opening this up? And they were like, are we included? And I said, of course you are. That's why you have no passport. Uh, and, uh, and so it's become this other thing, which is uh, we do conferences. We just did one that was on HowlRound, uh, still archived on HowlRound. If you go on the video library, we found a passport. Uh, we had it on Friday, where we taught about it was our keynote. We have a press, where we now publish about 20 titles. Ruthie's book, Red Cross, and other plays, among others. That's how long just the importance of staying earnest. So I'll just say that No Passport has been this kind of other creative life of mine, um, sort of entrepreneurial, somewhat curatorial in, in instinct, um, mostly just about kind of creating a place to throw ideas around. And through that, uh, I, you know, I'm a writer, I'm a playwright, so I, do, I write plays. And, and, uh, and I wrote a play called The Way of Water, which is part of a project of plays about the working poor in the United States. Uh, and it's sort of a uh, project that sort of emerged after a murder play called Papa, which is about a young woman who wants to play soccer, uh, and it's said West Texas, and uh, looking at a Latino family. And, uh, and I thought, oh, my next play, what will it be? And I was like, Deepwater Horizon, and I've got to talk about that. And uh, I've also been doing a lot of research and traveling in that region, and sort of collecting stories on my own, but never really thinking it'd be a play. And then uh, the play sort of overcame, you know, kind of took over me as a writer, and, and when that happens, I always think it's a good sign. Because uh, it's like you're, you're out of the way, and the play is sort of making itself in front of you. And uh, so I wrote this play called The Way of Water, and then I do what most people do, I guess, if they're playwrights, I guess. You know, they, they say, oh, well, now I have a play, and now I sit around, and, you know, and I was like, um, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do, but I don't. Like, I, I want to have a different phase of process with this work. And I also, it's the second anniversary of Deepwater Horizon disaster was uh, about to occur. This was in April of 2012, and, and uh, you know, we're in the third anniversary. And, uh, and, I, and I felt I want to have the conversation now. Uh, and I feel like the health, and health issues especially, uh, are still not talked about, and they're kind of buried in the news. And uh, we, we understand, we sort of are gleaning uh, the ecological aspect of what's the devastation <coughs> in the Gulf. Uh, and so I just wanted to have a conversation with this play with other people, and uh, which is, I think, what theater does, because it's a public forum. Look at us in a public forum today, uh, and engaging one on one and sometimes in groups. And so um, I thought, um, why don't I just call some friends and see if they're reading to the play? Simultaneously was the original idea. Call some friends, and they were like, totally cool, I want to be on board. I can't do it on the same day, sorry. Uh, can we do it in the month? And I was like, okay, let's do it the month of April. I'll bracket that month. And then what happened is that it became sort of word of mouth thing. So like that friend, blah, 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 told the other friend. And suddenly, you know, I was in the middle of uh, 50 readings <laughs> in one month all over the world uh, of this one play that was also in process. So the, I had the ardent activist brain sort of working uh, to engage in action, to talk about um, these people's lives on the Gulf. There are citizens, there are neighbors, there are brothers and sisters, you know, and, and then the other part of me is like playwright girl going, I'm still working on the play, you know, and, and, and kind of seeing readings of the play happen over time, over a one month period, where I was still rewriting and kind of hearing it in different, I heard it like in the Western Australian accent, I heard it in Germany, I heard it in Sao Paulo in Portuguese in a translation by Chris Blaid, I heard it in Rio, you know, um, you know, in London, you know, so it, it's interesting, and also laterally in terms of universities, colleges, theaters, uh, gallery spaces, garage theaters here, uh, you know, even at Emerson, a company called Atomic Age, which is for my students. So, um, yeah, and I just thought it was really cool to have this kind of very lateral experience and create an archive, ask everybody to contribute if they wanted to, testimonials about how it sort of worked in their community, what kind of discussions they had after the piece, or as practitioners inside of the piece, what they felt. Um, learning, 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 and, and having that engagement in the now, in the now of the writing process, in the now of, of the making of the work. And, and obviously, I still want the play, you know, I still am like, have my, whatever that means, traditional hat on, of like, yes, and it's the theaters and blah, 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 but I've also had this other experience with the play with multiple audiences. I mean, in the space of a month, a thousand people heard my play, you know, and so I was like, that's really awesome, really cool, but also it's like I'm learning a lot about process and I'm also learning in a weird way about in terms of no password thinking to go past you know our own little enclave and to think globally uh, and so then in November of 2012 um, got it into my hand yet again I was working on the third play in the quartet which is about three sisters in North Carolina one of whom is returning war vet 
uh, from Afghanistan and, uh, and wanting to, again, the two weeks of lead time, which is really insane. Uh, I said, oh, let's do another scheme. That is crazy, you know, and so I was like, okay, and then I started calling people again. And then some people had been part of the way of water because the energy was really strong, but also um, people I didn't know, you know, so I put a call out on the search at APTA, on the theater, religion, theater, performance studies. I just went wide, and I had no idea who was going to respond. You know, it could it could be blanks, you know what I mean? Uh, and then people started responding. And yeah, I want to do it in my, you know, I want to do it, in, and, and it was sort of, and I started meeting new collaborators, which I thought was really cool. and and very different experiences, people coming into it very directly, uh, told them I was absolutely placed in process, I'm gonna be working on it while, while all this is happening. So in November uh, last year, we had 32 readings uh, within about, I'd say, a three week time frame. Uh, and again, sort of it went global, like there was a reading in Korea, and like, you know, and, um, you know, in Western Australia, you know, so thankful to collaborators who wanted to jump on board. Blind Faith, uh, a leap of faith, which is I think what art always demands, uh, and a sharing, a desire to share something, and also to to have, you know, I think for me the most the humbling thing is to have like student voices, you know, like people who are not even, who don't even call themselves actors, are not even a BFA program for us, like, you know what I mean, we're just like, I'm coming upon this, and this is how I hear this. And to me, that kind of raw voice is very beautiful because there's no preconception around what uh, theater making is. And, but they're engaging with character and story, which is something I'm still interested in as a theater maker, uh, and, and, uh, and looking at it that way. So, and that's led to, actually, it, all, both of those actions, just in terms of the art making, because I kept telling people I was writing a quartet, but I actually didn't have the fourth play. Uh, <laughs> made me write the fourth play, which I, I wrote in December just on a dare, and, and it's about the Christian right, and, uh, and I had a lesbian woman coming back to her family. So, um, yeah, so, but yeah, but this is like a, I think the two kind of schemes and the sort of, the, the, the putting yourself out there, and I would say all oh, this was like for free, there's no funding, I have no infrastructure, it's like really like on faith, you know, truly on faith. Uh, of wanting to kind of experience something, but it also inspired me in turn as an artist to make another piece. Because I also felt that uh, responsibility to all those collaborators, because I did keep telling them there's a fourth play to happen, and they were like, yeah, sure. And I was like, oh my gosh, I better write it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think that's, um, it's given me faith, but it's also made me think about different ways of art making and different models that one can perhaps engage with, but also about making things in the now. Thank you very much. Really inspiring. All of you. Um, because this is a panel on women in action and women artists taking uh, ownership and taking action, I'm interested. There is a range of actions, and I think we tend to think very narrowly about what actions count. And um, so I want, uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that process of discovering I can take this action. Um, even if it's as simple as I can pick up the phone and ask a number of people to do this reading, or I can, you uh, Ruth was speaking earlier about your collaboration with Fred Ho and how that um, changed some of your thinking, or even Charlotte. Like, what are those, you know, those aha moments of I can actually take this action? Yeah, um, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about Seven, which is a project oh, right. that, um, that I made with seven female playwrights and it was initiated by Carol Mack and she just got the idea that she'll get together um, some of her friends and we would um, interview women leaders from all over the world and we would transcribe those interviews and then make monologues and then weave the monologues into a play and that um, project because I don't know if it's because there were seven of us involved or because of the seven leaders that were also involved. But it seems like that project has gone further than any of my other plays, and it's spoken to audiences all over the world and then performed in a kind of vagina monologues way where the actors playing the roles of the women can be played by men, they can be played by politicians, they can be played by actresses. And, um, the model of that has really inspired me to work also with other playwrights and to deepen my relationships 
with other women, <laughs> which is um, also, I would say that this conversation that we've had, and a lot of it's been by email, sometimes by phone, this is, has been informal, it hasn't been funded or anything, but the conversations that we've had privately and this one today, and <coughs> well, I guess we have one male person. <laughs> 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 but I think it's, it's great to have women just coming together and working together because the power of that is, that is so inspiring. And I think I have a friend, Elise Singer, who I've worked with for many years, and this is just something, it's maybe anecdotal, but it's not It's not to me anecdotal because it's been, um, we started a buddy system, and we were inspired by this book, Artist's Guide or something. Um, and we check in with each other every couple weeks, and we give each other our list of five tasks that they're all supposed to be creative, not teaching, not, I mean, teaching is creative, of course, but you know what I mean, you know? It's, um, about our creative work and the power of our, we did it all last year and I just feel that it has helped me focus my energies and see where I'm spending my time and also to have somebody that I'm accountable to creatively has just been this tremendous boost of um, inspiration and I just feel like we have the resources even in this, this group and in this room to do anything we want if we put our minds together, you know. So seven is an example of that, where it went much further than any of us thought it would. But I think we can also do it pair by pair and in collectives like this that are informal and formal. I think everyone on this panel has worked on a fairly significant co collective project. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you had your project with Brian Puppet together, ultimately, and. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? About the power of that collectivity and how it shaped your approach to that project? Yeah, you know, having come, been educated in the United States and going to grad school, I think we're educated as individualists and to be on our own careers. Mm -hmm. And I think this is like the perfect moment to, to, to move away from that paradigm and to see how we meet other people. And I think that's what we're all alluding to is that um, it's actually, it's, it's when I feel most alive and excited. So I did work with Greta Puppet, but the primary activator for that project was Iman Alman from Flash Star Theater in Ramallah. And um, as a Jewish American and a Palestinian, um, we, we bonded in 2003, and the first project we did is I brought her over to do Theater of the Oppressed with some students at the University of Iowa. That worked out really well. It was the first time many of the students had met a Palestinian person. Mm -hmm. And then um, I went to Ramallah to work with um, Iman and Ashtar. And then um, we met and we said, well, what can we do next? And we wanted to do a play at the wall. Um, I will I try to make it short. It's nothing short. <laughs> so make, so make sure you all know to the the wall that was built uh, in Israel to separate the Palestinian Palestinian-occupied territories from where the settlers were living, right? This wasn't even... Yeah. It's called so, the I don't think it's too controversial, but that's basically <laughs> it. Okay. Um, it's called the security fence. And um, the idea was to do a play on the wall. And I thought, how can we do this? Bread and the theater. That they can get, uh, their, how, how many is it? 10 meters up yeah. into the air. They're like the only theater company I could think of that could get that high. <laughs> <laughs> so that the people could somehow for each other. But we realized very quickly that was too dangerous. And we ended up um, modifying, bringing two of um, Peter Schumann's uh, right hand men, who were women, um, over to Ramallah to do um, a peace parade. And we did a peace parade um, in the center of Ramallah. It took us two weeks to put it together. Um, so it was four women organizing, collaborating. And as a playwright, I didn't write a word. Um, it, that was my first experiment into not being a playwright, or um, although the genesis was for play, you know, and actually Iman had commissioned me to write a play. But I didn't feel that, that my voice was the right voice in that situation. And so that giving up my voice actually was a really interesting, empowering um, act, action. Um, so, 
It was a beautiful piece of parade. Um, it ended with one of Peter Schumann's Cantistoria. Um, and it was depicted in the AP press as a demonstration, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. But you can still find pictures of it out there. So I just say that um, the final piece of that is how beautiful it is to move from thinking me, me, me. And for me, it was like actually just saying, I'm going to have no voice. I'm just going to facilitate other people's visions. And that's what we did. It was all done by young people, um, all Palestinian young people. All the images that we presented them with were that. So to become a facilitator was fantastic and definitely part of my process as a player. It didn't take anything from me. Charlotte, um, part of the goal of what you're doing this week with Gita Living in Action is to um, just take a moment to point to the abundance of the actions that women are taking in theater uh, and how widespread the uh, sort of the field is. So um, I just wanted you to speak a little bit about you know what that says to you and, and what that means to you. I what I really want to focus on is presence and the positive photographic image rather than the negative photographic image. That people are actually working and people are actually changing the landscape just by doing what they do. We have some of the, the future now here in the audience, Adara Myers with her play tryouts, Obey Janice with her performance piece, Ufu and Oreos. We have Cecilia Breaker who's directing the play. Um, you know, I, I'm very, I'm amazed by what the new generation is doing, and I wanted to come together, us, um, show the work that we're doing and kind of usher in the new generation and to give them that uh, really uh, support and uh, respect that you're continuing on in this art form and you're making changes within it. Uh, and we need that. We need to keep changing and shifting. Theater is by nature uh, a sacrilegious art. It can't keep obeying the old rules. It has to keep changing. You know, and so, and Vanessa Gilbert is here, who directs my plays as well. And so, um, I want this dialogue to go across cultures, I want it to go across generations, and I want to invest in people. And, you know, I think also with what Lisa was talking about with writing and letting other voices come through, I'm personally involved in a project like that now at Eden College. Never did I think that I would be commissioned to do anything by the U.S. <laughs> Department of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am to tell you I have. And the way that this happened, <laughs> you know, because I mean, I'm a mutinous soul. I mean, let me just put it that way. I'm sure I'm on many lists for other things I've done. But this sociologist, Kirsty Ulo, who's an expert on violence against women, and this anthropologist, Gabriela Torres, who's Guatemalan and writes about you know, violence against women in war. Both of them are my colleagues at Wheaton College and asked me if I would get involved in a project about how sexual experiences play out on campus mm -hmm. among students where like, you know, oftentimes in those situations we're talking about people getting hurt, mm -hmm. in particular women. Um, and so I said to them immediately, I, I could write that play, I can make anything up. You know, we're all playwrights, we can make it up. But I'd rather get together with a group of students and use some techniques from sociodrama and, and, and theater to be impressed in other areas and have them develop the play with me. So I'm now in about my fifth week with them and they are just blowing my mind with what they're performing. They are making up the scenes and performing them on the spot. By the way, I wanted no theater majors. I wanted all people who are studying other things and have no experience in theater. Um, and we have one of the students in the class who's videoing them, so we're developing this together. And it's been an incredibly humbling experience because I'm learning, again, anew how very deep young students are and how aware they are of what is going on in their lives. Um, and it's an example, as you were saying, about the seven, where I never expected to be doing this, and here I am, doing something. 
And the plan is to have this play at freshman orientations in, in many colleges and universities in the country as we can work with. And as we know from the presidential campaign, this is a deeply political idea. It seems, I mean, it seems like a safety idea to everyone in this room. But too many people, you know, in this country, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, it's a politically challenging thought. Um, I think that's amazing. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, in your comments about crossing borders, and I believe all of you have also the many, the Venn diagram of you, you guys, it's amazing. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about your experiences developing, you know, your voice and your music, uh, sort of world folk opera, um, and, and, and sort of what the, that notion of crossing borders and being in other cultures means for you, uh, just as an individual artist and as an American artist. Yeah, I think we're all um, members or have been affiliated Theater Without Borders as well, another organization that isn't an organization. <laughs> um, it's very different than, uh, it doesn't have, a, we were talking about it earlier, it doesn't have a board, it doesn't have funding, it doesn't have anything, <laughs> but it is a website and it's a conversation, it's an idea, and it's been very important to all of us, I think, as we travel and have conversations with each other. But for me personally, going to Bosnia in 1999 was uh, a time when I think of my proscenium of the world just was blown apart. And I was going to say my mother, she was a peacekeeper for the UN um, for five years in Bosnia. And it opened my eyes to what was going on in the world in a way that you can't read in the newspaper. You can read it in the newspaper, but when you see uh, bullet holes and pick up shells off the ground and you see what's really happening and the, the turmoil that it takes on people's lives, it's different and it impacts you in a way that a newspaper just cannot do. And when I was there, I heard music. Um, <laughs> and it took me several years to understand what music I had heard um, because it was in a marketplace and there was a dress shop and I had gone there during the day and they invited us to come back at night and um, we came back at night and everything was closed down and the woman who had been selling the dresses during the day um, had two children who were, I guess, playing music for orchestras and they came back with various instruments and then they put the um, oboe down and picked up went over to the piano and played music that I'd never heard before on the piano and then they sang and my heart was just uh, broken and open and, and I found out later it was gypsy music, Roman music and that they were originally from Bucharest and they found their way um, into Sarajevo and that music became really a call to my soul and I feel like I'll spend the rest of my life trying to learn this music and, and um, being inspired by it. Um, so that entered into my work in a way that I didn't really even intend, but it just took, like you were saying, took me over, you know. And um, I think it's because I travel a lot that, it, that I responded so much to the sense of being transient, the um, not always having a home, having things in boxes and moving and shifting around. Um, <laughs> So that was part of what I was struck by. But I think then it also made me want to go and do everything I could, save up my money, to go wherever I could. And once you open that invitation to the world and say, I'm willing to go into places that are not safe, into places that um, maybe I, I have to be you know, cautious, war-torn places, places where there's violence, um, once you're willing to do that, then somehow roads appear. <laughs> there's a, a, a gypsy national anthem that we sing, and one of the last verses translated means, the roads are open. <laughs> and it's like, come. <laughs> and so once you start to go, you see things, and you can't stop seeing them, because I guess less than 5% of Americans have that. Wow. 
So the Americans are not going, and that's why we have this problem with understanding the broader culture. I think maybe that's an old statistic, but hopefully it's nice. <laughs> but that, that strikes me as with your company, you no know, passport and like trying to cross those borders takes a lot of gumption and you've got to take some risks to put yourself out there and not to go to the vacation places and to not travel like a vacationer, not travel like a tourist where everything is there for you to consume and, and um, own and occupy, <laughs> but you're there to, in a more um, pilgrimage type of way, you're there to be enlightened, you're there to leave everything as you found it, if you can. And so there's an art to traveling, there's an art to crossing borders, and I think it, um, it's a constant process of learning that art. And it's not something I've mastered, but it's something that I want to keep putting myself um, into the road of and to follow that road wherever it takes me. Um, I love that idea of the roads are open. Mm -hmm. I wonder if anyone wants to comment on, um, as it is, since we do have some young artists in the room, that moment or that uh, how do you find it in yourself to have the courage to follow that open road or to even um, acknowledge that it's there and walk it? I think you have to listen, right? I mean, it, you know, first you have to be willing to listen uh, to what that is. And I think sometimes it's about listening without fear. Uh, and sometimes it's about um, that simple thing of like, truly just picking up the phone or, you know, or emailing somebody you don't know and saying, do you want to work together? Uh, which is a pretty scary thing to do, especially if you have a very strong artistic vision uh, to kind of be willing to say, okay, I don't know who you are, let's make some work. Um, I think it's also about where you place your energies. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, this year, you know, in particular, I was exhausted from the quartet and every, everything else, you know, that we've been doing with No Passport and, and just in my own work as an artist. And, um, but then, you know, Molly Smith said, I'm organizing a March on Washington for drug control. And I was like, he said, I'm doing it as, a, as an artist. I'm not doing it via our main stage. And, and, and I was like, that's awesome. I'm there. Let's make some theater too. So I was like determined to like create a theater action in Washington, D.C. on that same day, uh, again with the lead time. And, did an open call and received over 100 plays, you know, and uh, and someone had to put this action together and like make it happen. The Theater J and Force Collision came on board, and we're now staging another action in New York in April 29th. Uh, so that all happens because you just listen, you know, you just go like, oh, there's a space here, and there's a space where we can be in conversation with an idea that's bigger than us, you know, and it's bigger than the work itself in a way, and, and that the work can have many um, arms. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that's something that I think, you know, just for me personally as an artist is, uh, has been eye-opening, and, and it's also like, a, you know, as Ruthie says, it kind of like, there's that place where you're making things, and then there's that place where you open things up, and that changes you forever, you know, and I know that all the work that I did prior to, to sort of that first invitation with no passport, which really I think being a Radcliffe just kind of, what did Radcliffe give me? Time and space to dream, you know what I mean, for a year and make a lot of work <laughs> because I felt I was one of the few freelance artists there. So I was like making work all the time because the studio space is going to go away. Um, but you know, but it also made me think about other ways of dreaming. And I think that in that process, you know, I was like, wait, step back, like what are you doing and, and why are you doing it and you start to look at your value system and also like what people think of as being your currency, uh, which you know we, we treat our art sometimes in the market economy as currency and, uh, and what is the meaning behind that when you yourself don't view it that way uh, but yet it's positioned that way. Uh, and so I, so I just put it, it just, it, you know, every, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I often have written about, like, you know, what happened, and, and no passport, no passport is an amoeba, you know what I mean? I, I, you know, it, it is this ever-evolving thing, so I feel like it's also, like, it exists on its own as a loose collective, and, and, and it's the I and the we, you know, it's the, it's, we're all in this, we're all I and we's in it, you know? And, uh, and for me, that's the, 
but, but it's also a space of listening. It's like what, what's come bubbling up and how do you respond to it? And as artists, that's what we do, right? We listen, we put our ear to the ground, and we respond. And we respond, and the world is doing this, and we respond, or we want to reflect, or we want to engage, or we want to create action, or we want to make temporary art, or we want to make museum art, or you know, however we describe it. So yeah, but that's but that's it's about opening your heart. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. <laughs> I I what I was just gonna say that it's I think as artists also as like human beings, you know, just to look at where we're drawn. And to go towards what we're we're drawn to, but also to look at what we fear most and the places we most don't want to go, and to go there sometimes, um, and see see what's there for us. And you know, not maybe you know, if we flip this room and we were all men talking about action, and, you know, the future of women in theater, or you know, just flipping, going to the neighborhood that you wouldn't go to, and seeing if there's something there for you to do. I I don't know. That seems like a beginning. I'm wondering about, um, there's a lot of things that you all have done that could be categorized as entrepreneurial, and I'm wondering about, uh, if you have any thoughts about how to be entrepreneurial without falling into the traps um, that operating within uh, a capitalist, slightly Darwinian uh, system yeah. uh, sets for us um, in order, you know, the ways we, we get heard and seen and, 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 and keep creating them. I have two little schemes right now. <laughs> <laughs> One is to create an avant-garde light, L-I-T-E, family show with this group of lighting designers who created this uh, company wherein they would make works once a year. And I don't know that they're still doing it right now even. Um, but I want to get them to do it with me. They're called Tent. Um, and I just... <coughs> by chance met the wife of one of them um, who is amazing and found out by accident in our conversation that she's married to one of them. And I thought, well, we just have to make something together. That's that. Um, and, you know, I have children. So I want to take them to the theater and I want to take them to things that they're going to find fun and interesting, and that's going to make them want to keep going to the theater. So I have taken them to Blue Man Group and Stomp. And through them, I have loved those shows. <laughs> I actually think Stomp is very political, very political, about taking the garbage of the world and making something amazing. It always makes me cry. And so I want to make a show like that, that goes everywhere, um, and that is rich, but is accessible to kids. You know, and then my other little scheme, um, and I don't think I can say the part about wanting to escape my teaching, a part of it, well, I just said it. I love my students, I love you, I love you, but I want to teach a little bit fewer of you. Um, um, <laughs> 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 Um, and all of us have mischievous, you know, parts to us where we want to have another secret life or, you know, um, and escape our lives. And this one is that we are making a cartoon. We want to be famous New Yorker cartoonists. Um, and we've started, I do the dialogues and she's making the little illustration of these two women. And that's all I'll say. But you know what? Whether or not it becomes money, we need our fantasy. Mm. that we can keep sustaining ourselves. And those are my two fantasies of the moment. Mm. Yeah, I think we have to be entrepreneurial if we live in America because we live in a capitalist um, system. So by nature of where we're living, if we continue to live in America, we have to be entrepreneurial. But I don't think we have to um, just reflect the dominant popular culture. And so doing small things like shifting the um, center of the focus of our place to a female perspective is a huge shift <laughs> in terms of the dominant culture. So even within the entrepreneurial 
if we use the entrepreneurial skills that we have, which I think Americans all have, because it's built into us in our ideology that we don't even acknowledge. But if since we have that, um, and we have to be good at it in some way, we have to find a way to use it for a good purpose. And I'm not saying artists are even all good people. I'm, I'm not always a good person. You know, and I think we get that idea too, that the artist is good, and in the former Yugoslavia, the artists were involved in the civil war, in starting the civil war. So I think that we are not necessarily always good, um, but we can try to do something that is productive and has some kind of common interest at the heart of it. And so we use the, to, mark, to use a little Marxism, to control the means of our production, we can steer that production in a direction that we hope is um, a little bit more abstract. I think, again, abstracting the dominant culture so that we're not just sitting here regurgitating what it is put upon us without any kind of judgment on it. But we're resisting that, shifting it, um, even when it, I like to talk a lot about realism because it's a capitalist, in my opinion, capitalist ideology that um, we see on our stages all the time. Mm -hmm. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier with Fred Ho's work, where um, instead of building a, an expensive set that looks like a living room, and in my opinion, just lets the audience feel comfortable that these mm -hmm. actors are not homeless or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> you see the furniture, they feel better about their own furniture or something. So, um, <laughs> but the, the work I've made with Fred Ho doesn't need scenery. The artist, the behavior, the martial arts choreography is the scenic behavior, and that's all that's needed. Some costumes um, that can withstand a lot of stage combat, <laughs> and, and lighting, and live music. And then you're not wasting all that money building mm -hmm. furniture that is just going to be torn down and mm -hmm. then can't go anywhere. You can't mm -hmm. haul that furniture without a huge expense. So why not do what theater is good at and have that scenic behavior that is part of the spectacle that theater is really meant to be, and also then let that be portable in different spaces and speak to different audiences that um, can then be enlivened by the live experience of that scenic behavior. Well, I think that the couch, the famous couch, I think that the theater that comforts, that, that, that is realism. Mm -hmm. um, I think something that, 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 that audiences are seeking in that kind of art is they want to know where they are. They want to be situated in a place in which, of course, as we've been talking about, the courage to go on the open road and to cross borders and to, to act up. Um, you know, it seems to me that should be um, the direction that art pushes us in. Um, but I do think there is that very strong impulse to be in a house, literally and figuratively, when you're in the theater. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a curious, and I think it has to do with a lot of the instability in, in living in a capitalist system. Um, that we cling on to that in a really strong way. Um, I had a lot of time to study these couch plays. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are um, just about out of time. I'm, I want to thank, again, Kate and Boston University and Theater for having us here and all of you for coming out. Um, any last thoughts? Uh, you want to? Uh, you should tell us more about what's going on this week. Yes, I. I um, well, tomorrow night we have Ruth Barbara, Lisa Schlesinger, and Magdalene Gomez performing at the Factory Theater at seven thirty, and then on Friday and Saturday nights we have the Future Now. Alexia Stamatiu, who is a visual artist, Obey Dennis, who will be performing Group Honorios, and Adara Meyer's play Tryouts, directed by Cecilia Raker. I also want to give a special shout out to Alana Brownstein, who will be doing the post show discussion, which I think is really important and very much ties in with our discussion today, in that we are, I'm trying to create a new model for cultural conversation after shows rather than what the artists needed to change. <laughs> and so that we are all in dialogue together.
together about what the intentions were, what went on there, what it sparked in the audience, what's going on in our culture that is connected to that. So that's very much what today is about. That's what the rest of the week is about. And I hope that many of you will come. Yeah. Tomorrow night is free. Tomorrow night is free, I should free. have said. Thank you for that. Free. We want to keep the capitalist yes. model at bay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you.